Jesus said we must forgive one another. But how many of us actually find that easy to do so? It's one of those scriptures that you hear people preach that no one wants to believe. Which is exactly why I'm going to preach it. I'm going to be reading from Matthew 18, 21 through 35. It's a long one, trust me. It says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion and released him and forgave him the loan. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw this, mm -hmm. they were deeply distressed and went and reported it to their master. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said unto him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have also had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if you do not forgive his brother from his heart. Forgiveness sets you free. Mm, sir. A lot of people don't understand that because they're like, how does it set me free? I'm forgiving them, I'm not forgiving me. But did his unforgiveness not jail him? Didn't his unforgiveness cause him to not be free? It works that same way. If you forgive others, you will be forgiven. You will be freed from the punishment that we are all due to get. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness helps you as well. It doesn't just help them. You're storing bitterness in your heart. And forgiveness is a way to let it out. Right. Bitterness is not anything you want to keep. Bitterness is not comfortable. Yeah. Bitterness is a taste, isn't it? It's, it's gross. It's not something you want to keep in your mouth for a while. <laughs> That's why we call hatred and unforgiveness bitterness. It's not something you want to keep around. So why forgive? Well... Jesus said we must. That's, that's a really good reason in my book. <laughs> Jesus said so. I mean, if you really love someone, you care about what they say. You care about what they want you to do, right? And if you really love Jesus and he says, forgive people, what do you want to do? You want to make him proud. You want to forgive him. You want to forgive others, not him. Of course, he didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> You, you want to forgive people because that person you love, that person you care about, said forgive people. Forgiveness improves our relationships. You know, when I think of unforgiveness, I think of a really, really big fictional character. And if you guys know me, you probably know who this fictional character probably is. It's Darth Vader. <laughs> In the passage I just read to you, the slave that did not forgive his servant did what? And I find this really ironic. He strangled him. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of Darth Vader, force choke. <laughs> then he drops him and goes, apology accepted, Admiral, yet? <laughs> I don't think so. 
The aftermath of forgiveness is, well, it clears your conscience. You're no longer holding that bitterness. You're, not, you're no longer angry. In fact, you can move on with your life and be happy in the joy of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Another benefit in the aftermath of forgiveness is that others will be more likely to forgive you. Mm -hmm. Like in the parable, if, he, if the slave would have just forgiven that other slave, his master would have forgiven him. It would have made his master more likely to forgive him. And because he didn't, his master did not forgive him in the end. I don't care how much you want to believe Jesus was wrong. He wasn't. Forgiveness will set you free. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight I will be reading from Proverbs 4, verses 24 to 27. And it reads this. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and, gaze, and your gaze be straight before you. Pond the, ponder the path of your feet, then all the ways you will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left or turn your foot, turn your foot away from evil. Tonight I want to talk about something that's been really hard for me um, and God's been talking to me about a lot and it is the fact that we should set an example to those who are coming behind us, new Christians, younger generations, whoever is looking up to you. And so long I've been living this two-faced life and it's so hard for me to um, see the good in that. Um, th there's nothing that comes good from that. Um, it only harms you and your reputation and it harms the people who are coming up because they follow what you lead. Um, to start your um, to start your way, something you need to do first is guard your eyes and your ears. That's something that's so important. You need to guard what's coming in because that is what you put out. If you guard your eyes, men, men are very visual. Um, if you think of the story of David and Bathsheba, David is up strolling around on his rooftop, and he looks, and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. That, there's no sin in that. He saw her. If he would have gone away, he would have been perfectly fine if he had not thought on that. But he sat there, and he watched her. He let that lust fill up in his heart, and he let it just um, take over him. He went to as far as bringing her to his castle, having an affair with her, and then ending up killing her husband. Mm. So one lustful desire turned into a lot of sin. But it goes from that, that extreme, to the littlest of things. Guard your ears, even coming out of music. Music is a big part of my life. It's something I love. But if you are having a problem like you're having a lust problem, or you're having uh, a problem with swearing, or thing, different things. Let me ask you this. What is on your iPod? What is on your playlist? If you are filling your mind up with all this stuff, what do you expect to come out? Something my parents have always told me is garbage in, garbage out. If you fill your mind with garbage, you let Satan plant a seed and enter through your eye gateways and your ear gateways, then you're going to spit it out. Have you ever had this moment when you're talking to someone, but you're thinking, you're thinking of something that you've done before, you're thinking on it constantly, and all of a sudden they ask you a question, and you say something, and you're like, whoops, I didn't mean to say that. And that their first response is, what did you say? First thing is, Matthew 12, 34 says, from the abundance of the, uh, the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you're thinking of, whatever's on your mind, whatever's been placed into your head, is what you're going to be spitting out. Right. And in Proverbs 4, 24, they say, keep corrupt talk far from your mouth. Whether this be um, obscene or um, swearing or different things, or if it's just hurtful to someone, keep that away from your lips so that it's not harming someone else and harming your reputation. One more thing that I, that I feel is really necessary in your 
um, reputation is to watch what you're doing. Who are you hanging out with? Are your friends people who are building you up in Christ? Are they people who are bringing you around? Or are they corrupting you? In 1 Corinthians 15.33, it says, bad company corrupts good morals. Is that something you want to live with? You have your people with you, and you want to be edifying Christ, or you want to be here for Christ, and they're bringing you down. They're always dragging you down. What do you need them for? Are they your friends? Not really. When you're with them, what do you do? Is that glorifying God? Are you listening to bad music? Are you doing bad things? Are you just out there just fulfilling your desires? I dealt with this a lot, and growing, growing up and finding out my calling, being children's ministry, I have to set an example for them. I have to build up everything, build up my reputation, so that they will have something to look up for. Um, I say all this to just leave you with this charge. Acts 20, 28 says, watch yourself and lead my flock. So as ministers of the gospel, keep yourself clean. Keep yourself within the church, within Christ, and lead the flock. Thank you. Amen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you will, please turn um, in your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. Um, 119, verses 2 and 18. That's Psalms 119, verses 2 and 18. It says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. Verse 18, it says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy love. And in Colossians chapter 3, Verses 1 and 2, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. I entitled my message today, Focus on Why You're Here. A couple of days ago, I was in the gym, shooting some hoops, spending some time with God, and listening to Caleb on the radio. And anyways, um, some guys came in, and... They noticed that I was trying to shoot the hoops, but I really didn't know how because I had really no experience. And so anyways, my friend came over and he was giving me some pointers on how to shoot the basket. And then he was asking me questions about my family in the Philippines and, you know, like why I'm here at school and stuff like that. And then he was saying, well, just focus on why you're here. You see, that I put into playing basketball but I didn't really put it into applying it here at school. And so after, anyways, I was able to put that in the pointers into shooting basketball, I can do pretty well now than what I did a couple days ago. So anyways, today, what are we doing to have our focus on God? The reason why we're here is because God called us, called us here. Each and every one of us has a purpose. Has, I mean, has, God has a plan and a meaning for each and every one of us and why we are here. It might not all be the same, and we might not all be here for the same amount of time. Some people might he be here just for a season, and others might be here for quite a long time. But each and every one of us has a different purpose, and God has a different plan for each of us. And sometimes we have those distractions that get in our way. You see... Our distractions might be something that's good, something that's bad, but the way we can get rid of those distractions is to give them all to God, to realize that we have them and to give them to God. Because there's no other way that we can actually get rid of them unless we do that. And once we do that, then we can seek God with our whole heart. You see, once we are able to seek God with our whole heart, then we can really focus on why we're here, why God called us here, and we can focus on more than just that. We can focus on those who need to know Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. Because there are so many people out in this world today who live in darkness and in sin. And they know, they do not know about Christ. 
they need to know about Christ and what Christ has done for them. And once we are able to focus on God, to seek him with all our hearts, and to share the gospel to those who are lost and dying, then we can truly, truly know that we are focusing on God and his call for our lives. One thing that, um, that is really needed in focusing on God is, of all people, I'm sure all of us like have distractions, you know? Some may have more than the other, but we shouldn't focus on what their distractions might be or on why God called him here, why God placed them in this place. Our, what we're supposed to do what our job is to do is to focus on why we're here and not others. Because whenever we focus on others and why they're here, and then, and then we start to judge them, and then we start to say, oh, they're not here for what God may have called them here to do. But we have no right to judge them in such a way. So what we should really do is to focus on why we're here, why God put us here, and to focus on our calling and to focus on the kingdom of God. Because we should be able to focus on God, share the gospel to those who don't know God, and make an eternal difference for Christ. Um, one of the things that I've learned was, other than shooting a basketball hoop, um, is <laughs> to really put yourself in everything that you have in God, because not everything that we learn here can we have learned somewhere else and not everything that we come to not everyone that we come to know and the things that we hear being preached like many times um i've heard you know like sermon like especially from dr bell last friday night that you should focus focus on why you're here focus on god like i like to hear personally myself i like to hear messages preach more than once because the first time around you think you got it all but the second time around it's even so much better because you learn a lot more you understand it better and you know that there's actually a meaning and a purpose for the sermon that which you heard more than once in conclusion to this I'll tell you a story about the last three days on crusades um I believe that it was Dr. J who had said when she was talking to us in the car. You know, let's, let's just pray that we come out of this as strong as when we first started. And that's what I, I'm praying for each and every one of us here today, that when we leave this semester, that when we will come out a lot stronger than when we first right. came here. To begin. Right. Thank you. How many Pentecostals does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> Takes ten. One to screw it in, and nine to pray against this, uh, to pray against the spirit of darkness. <laughs> Tonight's message is entitled "Get Your Shine On." <clears throat> Would you please turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter five, verse fourteen. That is Matthew. Chapter 5, verse 14. It says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. <clears throat> Don't hide your candles. People need to see that light. If, they can't, if you're stuck in the darkness, you won't find your way out unless you see the light. And I myself have a greater appreciation for the light because I was in the darkness and I couldn't see. It was only the light of the Lord that guided my way out. One who lights the deepest darkness. It talks in 
Isaiah um, 9, verses 2. That's Isaiah 9, verse 2. It says, People that walk in the darkness have seen a great light that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shine. When, once you see this light, you're able to share it with others. You don't just keep it to yourself. <clears throat> and sometimes when we're around darkness, it can be easy for us to grow dim. But we have to remember that if it wasn't for the light shining that we saw, then then we wouldn't be able then we wouldn't be able to be a light ourselves. <clears throat> we're a light for all that are in our health in the house. Right. Every, everyone who is around us should see us, and we should stand out uh, separate from, from those who are in the darkness. <clears throat> we shine to glorify God. We don't just shine for ourselves. We don't shine to say, look at me. We shine to say, look at him. Because he is the one. He is the one we're here to represent. We're not here to represent ourselves. We're here to represent, to represent the king, the king of kings. And he, he is the one true light. And it only, is it only through him that we see the light? That we must be that light. Because we may be the only light that some people right. see. Without right. us, they may never find their way. Right. Light makes everything visible. You know, we can, we can go into a deep, dark place and the people can keep secrets. But true light and the true man of God will shine with shed light and bring these things <clears throat> when surrounded by darkness, there's a temptation to blend in and get comfortable. But we not, must not give in to the ways of this world, but shine light under the world and stand out. The light of the Lord is a gift to be shared, yes. not kept to ourselves. We're supposed to share it. We're supposed to declare his name. We're supposed to show it. So when we walk into a room and somebody sees us, they say, that man's a Christian. They don't say he's just another one of us. He's just that. He's just that guy. They say he's a Christian. He's a man of God. They say, look at him All shine. Right. Can't you see All him? Right. And these people need this. So no matter where we go, no matter who sees us, they'll know that we stand for something. Right. That we stand for God. <clears throat> so when when you wake up every morning, you need to focus on being a light the world. Don't just focus on what you can do for yourself, but mm -hmm. focus on what you can do for the kingdom. That's focus on right. focus on being a beacon that people see, something that stands out when somebody is having a tough day and they're dark and they're depressed and they and they can't see any hope. They see you and they say, look at that man. That's that true. man That's is right. carrying a message of hope. Nice. He's got something to say. And then you, with that, just by the, they'll want to talk to you because you're inviting them with your light here. You're showing them something that they've never seen before. And you, then you talk to them and you share the truth with them. And they'll, they'll have a whole new outlook on life. Amen. I just want to encourage you, just to shine wherever you go. Right. Get your shine on. Don't, don't conform to the ways of this world. Yeah. Just wherever you go, just stand out so that when right. people see you, they know that there is a greater good. And they know that there is a God. Thank you. Good evening, y'all. Let's turn to Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And listen to this one. This is a good one. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Yeah. I've entitled my thoughts today, Hashtag. What is a hashtag, you might ask? A, the definition, Webster's, is a word or phrase preceded by a hash or pound sign that is used to identify messages on a specific 
topic. A hashtag identifies a trend. And what is a trend? A trend is what's new and cool. What are some current trends? Well, there's the iPhone and the Galaxy, or Facebook and Twitter, or a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Trends, if you really think about it, they don't do anything <laughs> at all. Nobody is gonna get saved because I have the new Galaxy or the new iPhone. And as much as I might want it to, my Facebook account isn't gonna change anybody's life. <laughs> and my high school relationships, they are not going to win anybody's soul for Christ. How long does a trend last? Well, let's look at some past trends. There was platform sneakers. Who remembers those? Sadly, I do. <laughs> or what about bell-bottom jeans? Yes. Or the mullet? Yes. <laughs> those are some uh, blast from the past trends. But think about it. We no longer wear platform sneakers. We got sick and tired of twisting our ankle every day trying to look cool. We have vans and flats now. We no longer wear bell-bottom jeans, thank the Lord. We wear straight leg jeans and skinny jeans. <sighs> and we curl and straighten our long hair, not our mullet. Trends are not constant. We are called to be ready in and out of season. Trends are simply seasonal. That's why we no longer wear platform sneakers or bell-bottom jeans. Our faith should be constant, not a trend. Yeah, that's right. Come on. Yeah. Trends cloud our judgment. They tell us we're cool and give us a false sense of accomplishment. You know how cool and accomplished I felt in sixth grade when I had my first boyfriend? You want to know what me and my first boyfriend did? We walked in the hallway and waved and smiled at each other. That lasted a whole glorious six hours. <laughs> Until the end of the day when I went and caught my bus and saw the cute new boy and I was like, whew, get a look at that cutie. Uh, goodbye boyfriend, hello new boy. That's a trend, y'all. You have something and you think it's the bomb.com and then you see what's new and cool. Trends are really hard not to follow. Right. When we see a commercial for a new phone or a new line of clothing or a new Prada handbag, if you are anything like me, you sit there and you think, I have to have it or I'm going to die. <laughs> Mom, did you hear that? I will die. Okay, this is a big deal. Why don't people think that when they look at you and me? If we're living the way the Bible tells us we should live, we should be showing Christ in everything we do. We should not be trying to accomplish the newest trends. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave you with this. Christianity is not a trend. It's a lifestyle. If we were called to do what's cool and trendy, we would not be here at this school. We would be at a different college, studying something different that's not gonna affect or impact right. anybody's life, right. like what we're studying here. We are not called to conform. We are called to go after what God has for us. Right. It may not always be cool, to be ready in and out of season. But you know something? It probably wasn't cool to die on a cross for people that didn't exist. We're called to be disciples. A disciple is the mirror image of something. We are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay? We should be striving every day to be just like Jesus, not like the newest trends. So let's stop making trends and start making a difference. Thank you.
Thank you.